say that they believe in God. You realize that the United States, uh, according to the pollsters, according to uh, all of the surveys that are done, we are the most religious country uh, in, the, uh, in the industrialized world. Uh, overwhelmingly, in fact, 90% of the people say that they believe in, in God, believe in a personal God. Uh, actually, only 2% uh, say that they are atheists in the United States, uh, which leaves several percentage in the middle that don't quite know what they are, uh, I guess. But uh, anyway, overwhelmingly, people claim to believe in God. In fact, 70% of the uh, people in this country say that they believe that religion plays a very important part in their life. Religion plays a, a big role in their lives. Uh, there are several uh, interesting statistics. There was a uh, one of these pollsters, uh, they, they took a poll on people uh, how many believe that they were going to heaven? Well, the figure was very high. Almost the whole 90 percent, uh, you know, checked off that they were going to heaven. Uh, how many of them believed that they knew someone who was going to hell? Well, a high percentage of them also knew somebody that was going to hell. Uh, but the number who actually believed that they personally were going to hell uh, was actually only a fraction of a fraction of a percent. There, there were very few that really thought it applied to them, it applied to their neighbor, it applied to somebody they didn't like, uh, applied to the guy across the road, uh, but it certainly didn't apply to them. Uh, you know, people have their ideas about, uh, about religion, and uh, for all of the claim that people make that religion really plays an important role in their lives, yet if we were to turn around and you look at the crime statistics and look at the divorce statistics and look at uh, uh, the uh, unwed uh, pregnancy statistics and look at all of these various things that are the result of a lifestyle that's very different than what you read in the Bible, you find that even though the, the majority of people, the overwhelming majority of people in this country claim that they believe in the Bible and that they believe in God, that they think they're going to heaven, you find that a pretty high percentage of them are clearly not letting God and the Bible and religion interfere a whole lot in their lives in terms of what they're doing. And, uh, you know, people have all sorts of ideas and have all sorts of opinions. Uh, Jesus uh, Christ took his own survey one time. Uh, you read that back in Matthew chapter 16. Uh, Jesus asked the disciples, actually, I guess you could say uh, he didn't so much take the survey as he let them take the survey. And then he asked them, what were the poll results? Uh, Jesus, uh, we're told in uh, Matthew chapter 16 and verse 13, when Jesus came to the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples and he said, whom do men say that I am? What's the word on the street? What are the opinions of people? Who do people think that I am? Well, what you found was people had a variety of opinions, most of which were totally wrong. But they, well, this guy thought this thing, this other fellow over here, he thought it was something else. Had all sorts of ideas, all sorts of opinions. So that by itself ought to give us a clue that if you really want to find out the truth about something, don't go and take an opinion poll. Uh, and think that just because most people say this or most people say that, that that must be the case. Uh, in Jesus' day, when he inquired, who do men say that I am? He found out people had opinions, but those opinions weren't right. Now, Jesus went on to ask the disciples after he heard what people said. He said, now, what do you say? Whom do you say that I am? And Peter immediately piped up, spoke for the group, and he said, well, he said, uh, we know who you are. You are the Christ. You are the Messiah, the anointed one, the one who is spoken of in the prophecies of the Scripture. You're the Messiah. You're the Son of the living God. Well, Jesus said, you know, flesh and blood hasn't revealed this to you. You didn't find that out by simply going to people and taking an opinion poll. Flesh and blood didn't reveal that to you. My Father who is in heaven. My Father's the one that revealed that to you. Made that clear. And he went on to say in verse 18, I say unto you, you are Peter. Now there's a play on words in the Greek language. 
that is a little bit hard to duplicate in English because uh, uh, the word Peter, which uh, we think of simply as a proper na a name, uh, in the uh, Greek language, uh, the word was Petros, which meant a little rock, a stone. He said, you are Peter, you're Petros. You're a little rock. And upon this rock, and here the word is Petra, he said, upon this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of hell, the gates of Hades, of the grave, will not prevail against it. Clearly, one of the reasons for which Jesus Christ came was to build his church. And the church was not built upon Peter. Peter was, uh, you know, had a certain rock-like quality, but it was not built on a little rock. It was built on the rock. That rock, the rock of Israel, that rock which followed them, that rock was Christ. That's what uh, Paul, how Paul defines it back in the book of uh, 1 Corinthians. So, Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone, as the Scripture says. The church is built on the foundation of the prophets and the apostles. So, Peter certainly played a part in that foundation. He's one of the apostles. The church is built on the foundation, Paul says in Ephesians 2, of the prophets, uh, the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. Jesus Christ took these 12 men that he had called out, that he selected, that he ordained as apostles, and he took them with him up and down the roads from Galilee to uh, Samaria to Judea and all over that whole area for three and a half years. And they walked and talked, and they watched him, they observed him, they heard his sermons. Jesus Christ gave them a period of three and a half years of intensive training. And then he was crucified, raised from the dead, ascended to heaven. Now, during the course of Christ's ministry, he sent the disciples out from time to time. You can read uh, one of the uh, uh, most uh, simply stated uh, uh, accounts is back in Luke 9, where Jesus called his 12 disciples together, Luke 9, 1, called his 12 disciples together, and he gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases, and he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. So Jesus Christ sent them out. He went, he went preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. Uh, as we're told in uh, Luke chapter 8, verse 1, came to pass, he went throughout every city and village preaching and showing the good tidings of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him. So Jesus went about, and he was preaching and teaching and healing and casting out demons and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. He took the twelve with him. He showed them what to do. He showed them how to do it. Then he selected those twelve, and he sent them out to preach and to teach. Then in chapter 10 of the book of Luke, verse 1, After these things, the Lord appointed another seventy also, and he sent them two by two before his, place, before his face into every place where he would come. He told them the harvest is great, the laborers are few. He told them that they were to go throughout the areas that he was sending them, verse 9, heal the sick, and say the kingdom of God has come near unto you. So Jesus Christ did certain things, preached and taught, healed the sick, cast out demons. He selected the twelve and he sent them out to do it. Other disciples, the seventy, he sent them out to do it. So he showed them how to do it, had them uh, carry out missions under his supervision. Then at the end of that three and a half years, after he was crucified, after he was raised from the dead, just before he ascended to heaven, he told the disciples, he said, I want you to go everywhere and preach to everybody. Go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. He said, teach them all the things I have commanded you. So he had spent three and a half years training and teaching them, showing them, showing them what to do, how to do it. Then he sent them out to do it. Jesus said, I will build my church. The gates of hell, the gates of Hades, the grave is not going to prevail against it. They were sent out, these disciples, 
that were a part of the foundation of that church because that's what we're told back in, uh, uh, we've made reference to it, but in Ephesians chapter 2, where we're uh, in verse 20, uh, that we're built, are, be, are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. You see, the church is built on this foundation. Now, the kingdom of God was to be announced, and the kingdom of God was, is going to be established on this earth. The disciples, even after hearing Jesus talk about the kingdom of God, were hazy about certain aspects, and one of the biggest areas of confusion had to do with when these things were going to happen. Luke chapter 19 recounts the story as Jesus was making his final journey to Jerusalem. He was coming across from Jericho and began that uh, Jericho was there uh, right uh, on the Jordan River, sort of in the plain of the Jordan River, and uh, it is low, and he was on his way up to Jerusalem because Jerusalem uh, you ascend up and the, uh, the uh, uh, elevation uh, increases. And they're making that ascent, traveling those miles from Jer Jericho to Jerusalem. And we're told that as they were on their way into Jerusalem, the disciples sensed that something big was about to happen. They could just sort of feel it in the air and just maybe by things uh, that Jesus was saying and the way that he was doing certain things, they knew something was about to happen. Now, you know, sometimes people can perceive that something is about to happen, but they're incorrect about when they guess what is about to happen. So the disciples knew something was about to happen, but what they thought was about to happen was that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. That's what we're told here in verse 11. They were sort of buzzing among themselves and saying, boy, you know, I, you know, there's something in the air. I, I think he's about ready to set up the kingdom. I think we're going to get to Jerusalem and he's going to set the whole thing up. Jesus knew what they were thinking. And he said, let me tell you a story. Let me tell you a story about a certain young nobleman who went away into a far country to get for himself a kingdom and to return. And... Before he left, he called his servants together, and he entrusted to each of them a certain sum of money. And he said, I want you to occupy till I come. I want you to use this. And then he went away, received the kingdom, came back. And when he returned, he called the servants together, and he demanded an accounting of how they had handled what he had given them. Well, then he rewarded them with a, a position in his kingdom based on how they had handled the responsibilities he had given them in his absence. Now, clearly, the point of the parable is that Jesus was not going to immediately set up the kingdom of God. Rather, he was going to go to Jerusalem, and he was going to die. But that wasn't the end of the story, because three days and three nights later, he was, going to raise, he was going to rise from the dead, and then he was going to ascend to heaven, to the throne of the Father. And he would receive a kingdom, and he would come back to this earth. And the time between when he left and when he returned, his servants were to be about the master's business. They were to be utilizing the opportunities and the, uh, the things that had been entrusted to them. Because when Christ returns with that kingdom, ready to establish that kingdom, you know, and Matthew 25 talks about when uh, the Son of Man shall come with, with all the holy angels, you know, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. Uh, that's when he's going to establish that, that kingdom. Well, then his servants are going to be rewarded according to their works, according to what they have done. And will receive a reward in that kingdom, whether it's being ruler over ten cities or five cities or whatever it is. He's illustrating a point. 
And he makes plain that there is something to be done in the interim between when he went into the far country, when he ascended to heaven, and the time when he returns. He was training the disciples, and he used them as a foundation of what was going to be done. You and I, sitting here in this room, are a continuation of what Jesus Christ personally started. We're here as a result of the Word of God that was passed from Jesus Christ personally and directly to men like Peter and James and John and Andrew and Philip and Bartholomew and Thomas and Matthew and all the others. Passed on by them to others of the next generation and so on and so on down through 20 centuries. And we're sitting here directly being taught and having been taught the same things that Jesus taught to the twelve. Because some of it was written down. We have it right here in front of us. And it was that message was passed on. It was taught from generation to generation by those who were faithful servants and who, uh, you know, faithfully... Uh, followed what was being taught that originated with the message that Jesus Christ brought to this earth from the Father. So we find a description here of how Christ uh, set up things. And he said, uh, as he uh, told Peter back in, uh, we read back in Matthew 16, he said, I, I will build my church. I'm going to build my church. And the gates of hell, the grave, Hades, are not going to prevail against it. Now, Jesus Christ, just before he, uh, when, when he, he got ready to send the disciples out, I want us to, let's look here briefly in Matthew 13. Now, Matthew tends to, to group information together by subject matter. So if you want to understand what Christ said on a particular subject, Matthew is a real good place to go because he tends to put things together, sometimes things that were said in several different places and sort of group them together in a more uh, detailed uh, exposition, more so than uh, Mark and Luke. But uh, on the other hand, uh, Mark and Luke uh, tend to follow more of a chronological uh, order. Luke, uh, Matthew uh, follows chronology just sort of in a general sense, but he's more uh, focused on the subject matter. One of the things that Mark brings out is that uh, uh, it was when Jesus selected and ordained the twelve and to send them out to preach the gospel, that right after that, he gave a parable. The first of the parables that uh, you, you find uh, in this sequence here in Matthew 13, because Matthew records seven parables that are designed to explain the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. Now, these things were spoken in parables because while it was given to the disciples to understand the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, everybody else didn't understand all the mysteries and weren't going to understand all the mysteries. But the disciples could because, you know, the parable makes it plain if you understand what the parable means. If all you have is the parable. Then you'd be like the disciples were, stand there, scratch their head, and say, what, I wonder what he meant by that. But you see, they had the option of calling him aside and saying, look, you just got through telling that story about a sower and seed, and, well, I don't have a clue what you're talking about. And Jesus then explained it. And Matthew, of course, records not only the parable, but the explanation. Now, Matthew actually records seven parables here in Matthew 13. And these seven parables were things the disciples needed to know on their way out to preach the gospel. As they were going out to, uh, uh, to proclaim the gospel, there were things that they needed to know. And they needed to know the mysteries of the kingdom. He was sending them out. He ordained them. He sent them out, told them to preach the gospel, heal the sick, cast out demons. But there were things they needed to know. And the first thing they needed to know was brought out in the first parable. First mystery of the kingdom, Jesus said, let me tell you something. 
me tell you a story about a man that went out to sow seed. He was sowing seed, broadcasting it. And you know, some of the seed fell by the wayside. And the birds just came and ate it up. It never never germinated, never uh, uh, never came up. It just sort of fell by the wayside, and the, and the birds ate it up. Now, some of the rest of the seed fell on stony ground. Very shallow layer of topsoil. The seed germinated, and it came up pretty quickly. But it only had a very shallow root system because it was on a shallow area of soil, rocky ground. So what happened was even though it germinated quickly, came up quickly, it didn't last very long. As soon as the weather got hot and dry, it just shriveled up. You know, it's not hard to have green grass right now. Uh, in fact, some of you may wish your grass wasn't quite so green. Uh, but, uh, you know, just, just wait a little while. And the chances are, by the time August gets here, uh, unless you're doing a little watering now and then, your grass isn't going to look nearly so green. Because you see, it has a shallow root system. And therefore, if it's not getting a lot of water, it doesn't stay green very long. Different than a tree that has a root system that goes, goes way down. So anyway, Jesus said some of it's going to fall on rocky ground, come up quickly, but it'll, uh, it, it'll die. It'll wither up and die in the hot, dry weather. Others of it will fall on ground, but there'll be a lot of weeds and thorns and thistles, and it'll come up, but so will they, and it'll just get choked out, and it'll never produce anything. Have you ever seen have you ever seen weeds get choked out by the garden? I've seen the garden get choked out by weeds. Uh, somehow, uh, you know, unless you help the garden along, uh, the weeds well, the weeds don't need any help. You know, you don't have to fertilize them, cultivate them. Uh, you don't have to water them. I mean, it's just uh, nothing you have to do. All you got to do is just leave it alone, and they'll grow. So Christ said, that's going to happen. And then he said, some of the seed will fall on good ground. It'll come up and be productive. Well, they didn't understand what that meant. And he said, well, let me explain it to you. He said, you know, I'm sending you out to preach the gospel. I'm sending you out to sow seed. And you know what's going to happen? A lot of that seed's never even going to germinate. There are going to be times when you speak to crowds of thousands. And for a lot of them, it's going to go in one ear and out the other. And there's the seed that falls by the wayside, never germinates. He said, some of the rest of it, you're going to get pretty excited because you're going to get a, a quick, intense response out of some folks. And you're going to get excited and say, boy, you know, that's great. Then what you're going to find is some of those who responded so quickly and, and with this initial emotional experience, they don't have any depth of root. They haven't put any roots down. And as soon as persecution and tribulation, difficulties because of obedience to the word comes up, you know what they're going to do? They're going to just sort of wither up and die. And there are others that are going to come on up, and they're going to be coming up, and you're going to be encouraged and say, well, boy, you know, that, that seed, that's, that's growing. But then gradually, they're going to get choked out by the cares of this life. Too many other circumstances, too many other things competing for your time and your energy get distracted, and the cares of this life just sort of choke it out. And you're going to find some of that seed germinates and it actually comes up and it starts bearing fruit. And some of it will bear a little bit of fruit and some of it will bear a lot of fruit, but it will bear fruit. It will come to harvest. Now, you know, that was pretty important for them to understand as they went out to sow the seed of the gospel. And that, if that was all they knew, it could be a little bit discouraging. In fact, a lot of what you sow is not going to come up. Some of what, a lot of what comes up is not going to come to harvest. Some of it's going to wither because it doesn't have any, the, the people didn't really prove things and don't have any depth of root. And some of them maybe have a little roots, but they get distracted. They get choked out. Too many other things competing for their time and their energy. And then some of it will come to harvest. So that was the first parable, first mystery of the kingdom to understand as he sent them out to preach the good news of the kingdom. The next thing he sent them out, in the next parable, down in the beginning in verse 24, he said, Now, there's another story. This one was also about a man sowing seed. He goes out and he plants his wheat. And, uh, but you know, later on, while it was dark, after everybody had gone to bed, he had an enemy. And his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat. 
Well, sure enough, you know, a little while later, as the crop began to come on up, come through the ground, one of his servants one day came to him and said, Master, he said, look at that field. Didn't you sow good seed? Hadn't you gone through and really uh, checked out the seed and made sure it was all wheat? Where did all these tares come from? And the master said, oh, an enemy's done this. And the servant said, well, you want us to go out and try to get all the tares out? The master said, no. No, if you go out and try to be uprooting all the tares, what you're going to wind up doing is also uprooting a lot of the wheat. Just leave it alone, and it'll grow. It'll come to harvest. And at harvest, it'll be very obvious what is the tear and what is the wheat. We'll go out, we'll gather all the tares, we'll put those in bundles, and we'll burn them. And then we'll gather the wheat and bring it into the barn. Well, the disciples asked him, he said, no, that's a nice story too, but what does that mean? And he said, well, the Son of Man is the one sowing the seed. See, it's the seeds of the kingdom, it's the, the, uh, uh, the gospel of the kingdom of God. The seed is being sown. He said, I'm the one that has the good seed. I've got the good news of the kingdom of God. But he said, the enemy is the devil. And he said, don't think that we can go out and we sow the seed of, of God's truth and here takes root and begins to come up. He said, the enemy, the devil, is going to go out and sow, and sow tares among the wheat. Now, you know, if we'd really understood this and those who did really understand the implications of this parable would not have been quite so shocked uh, in the events that occurred a few years ago when we found out that uh, uh, there was a lot of what was growing that was, uh, <laughs> you know, not wheat. You know how you can tell the difference between the wheat and the tares? There's, there's a real simple way. When the tares and the wheat both initially come up from the ground, the shape of the blade, the shape of the leaf, uh, looks very similar. Very hard to tell the difference in the very earliest stages of development. But the more it grows and the bigger it gets, the more obvious it becomes. And the real, of course, the clincher is the fact that the wheat heads out and bears wheat. That's, you know, what you harvest. It bears fruit. It has something that is edible that's good. And it heads on out and makes a, you know, a head of wheat. The tares, on the other hand, grow but they never, they, they don't head out. They don't, they, they don't produce fruit. They're, they're just a weed. They're not usable. They don't have something edible. So obviously, as it got on to harvest, it was very easy to tell the tares from the wheat. The wheat were the ones that had borne fruit, and the tares didn't. So it was very simple. See, the tares are defined on down as those that do iniquity, uh, and, and that offend. Those who are a stumbling block, those who practice lawlessness, those who are really not what they claim to be. They're not wheat, they're tares. So the first two parables, you know, Christ has given them two things. He's sending them out to sow seed, and he said the first thing you need to understand is most of what you sow is not going to come up. And most of what comes up is not going to come to harvest. Some of it's going to fall on stony ground, some of it's going to get choked out, and some of it will come up and bear fruit. He says, the other thing you need to understand is you go out and what's coming up, there's still going to be tares sown in among the wheat. And it's not your job to figure out what all the tares are. When the end comes, it'll be very apparent by then all the tares ultimately are going to be dealt with. Now, he didn't stop there. If he'd stopped there, they might have been a little bit discouraged about the job he was giving them. First couple of mysteries of the kingdom. The next thing he explained to them in verses 31 uh, on down through 33, he said, "Now let me give you a little good news." He said, uh, "You know, you go out and you so the seed that you sow can be very small." He said, "Take a grain of mustard seed. That's the smallest little seed, a uh, little herb that there is. You take this tiny, tiny little seed and you plant it in the ground, and you know what's going to happen? It's going to grow up, and make a great big bush, and..." Next thing you know, it'll be so big why little birds can come and sit in the branches. So he said, it may start out awfully small, but it's going to grow. And the other thing you need to understand is sort of like leavening. You know, most of you ladies have made bread at one time or another. You can take a little bit of leavening, a little bit of yeast, and you mix it in with the dough. And you knead it, and you know what? That leavening spreads, and it permeates the dough, and the whole lump rises. 
So it's important to understand that the seed is going to grow like a mustard seed. It's going to grow. It's going to get big. And not only that, it's going to spread and permeate everything. The time is going to come when the whole earth is going to be permeated with the knowledge of the kingdom of God. So don't be discouraged about the earlier two. It's going to grow and it's going to spread. Then he went on to explain to them in verse 44 and 45, he said, let me tell you a couple other things about the kingdom. On one hand, it's like a treasure hid in a field. And on the other hand, it's like a merchant man who is seeking goodly pearls. The gospel of the kingdom has value. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. If you found a treasure in a field, a valuable treasure, then you'd make great effort to obtain the field because you want the treasure. The kingdom of heaven is that treasure. It has great value. Not only that, then those who inherit the kingdom are going to be like the merchant man who seek goodly pearls. They recognize value when they see it. And they're willing to sacrifice everything in order to obtain what has real value. So, even though everything you sow won't come up and there are going to be tares that come up among the wheat, it's going to grow, it's going to spread, it has tremendous value, and those who will inherit that kingdom recognize that value. And verse 47 tells the seventh parable of the kingdom. He says, you know, you cast a net out. Of course, remember, several of the disciples were fishermen. Uh, they were familiar with casting a net. He said, you know, when you cast a net, you catch a lot of fish, but a lot of what you catch aren't keepers. You know, here they were fishing the Sea of Galilee, uh, and, uh, you know, when they cast that net and brought in uh, everything they'd caught, well, some of the fish they caught were unclean. Couldn't use those, had to throw them back. Others maybe for other reasons. So he said, don't worry about that. You know, you cast the net, God's going to sort out what's what. And so those were the seven mysteries of the kingdom that Jesus explained by parables to them at the time when he sent them out. He said, I'm going to build my church, and you fellows are part of the foundation. Together with the prophets, you represent the foundation. I'm the chief cornerstone. So there's some things that we understand from that. You know, there, there are other ways of understanding more about the purpose of the church. There are three primary things that the church is compared to in Scripture. The church is called the bride of Christ. The church is called the body of Christ. And the church is also called the household of God. Now, each of those three descriptions tell you something. Let's start out. Let's look at the bride of Christ. We all know what a bride is. And, uh, uh, you know, the Bible talks about that, talks about the wedding supper. It talks about the, uh, uh, uses various descriptions. In Ephesians chapter 5, Ephesians chapter 5, in verse 22, it says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. He's the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. So, on the one hand, wives were told that they were to uh, seek to respond to their husband, to be responsive to him, to submit to him, to adapt to him. Husbands were told, love your wives, not in a selfish way, but in a giving way. Christ loved the church and he gave himself for it. Now, as we come on down through here, we find this going back and forth, describing uh, husbands and wives. And in verse 32, Paul says, now this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. The husband-wife relationship is descriptive of the relationship of Christ and the church. 
So if we want to understand the purpose of the church, one of the things we need to understand then is the role of the bride, the role of the wife. Now, if you go back to Genesis, that becomes a very good place to understand that. You know, in Genesis chapter 1, in verse 26, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them, speaking not simply of Adam, but of mankind in general, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created man in his own image, and the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And God blessed them. He said, be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth, subdue it, have dominion, have rulership. So Adam and Eve, the first man and the first woman, were created to have rulership, to have dominion. If you come down a little later here in chapter 2, we find that uh, uh, verse 15, the Lord God took the man. He put him in the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat of it, for in the day you eat thereof you shall surely die. And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make an help, a helper, meet or compatible, comparable to him. And so God had made all these animals out of the dust of the ground. He brought them to Adam, let Adam name them, and there was none found among the animals that was compatible to Adam. There wasn't a helper there for him. There wasn't anything compatible for him with, with all these animals. God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. He slept and he took out one of his ribs and closed up the flesh. And the rib that he had taken, he made a woman, and he brought her to Adam. Now, Eve was created, the first bride, the first wife. She was created as a helper exactly compatible with Adam. What then is the church, the bride of Christ, designed to be but a helper exactly compatible, comparable to Christ? A helper that is fitting for him. Well, that's, un that's important for us to understand because I'll tell you, when you understand that, it gives you uh, the big picture of a lot of what God is doing in the whole purpose of the church. If the church is designed to be the bride of Christ, then that means the church has as its purpose the very purpose for which Eve was created just as she was designed as a helper, exactly compatible, someone to fit with and to be compatible with Adam, a helper for him in the job of rulership that he was given. So what do we find? But the church is designed to ultimately at the resurrection marry Christ. We're to be a helper to Jesus Christ, exactly compatible. Now that tells you several things. You know, if you understand that we're designed as a helper just as Eve was designed as a helper to Adam, and together they were to exercise dominion, lordship, rulership over the earth, what do we find that the saints are going to do? You remember in Revelation 20, John said, I saw thrones, and they that sat on them. And judgment was given unto them, and they ruled and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. They exercised dominion. They exercised rulership. They were there to help Jesus Christ as he exercises the government over the entire earth in tomorrow's world. Now, one of the things that anybody can pretty well figure out uh, that is important when it comes to a husband and wife, very apparent in the text here in Genesis 2, is that if they're going to be effective together, they're going to have to be compatible. They can't each have their own agenda being a different agenda and expect that there's going to be a lot of peace and harmony. Uh, Christ is not going to have a two-career marriage in, uh, uh, you know, in tomorrow's world where the bride has her ideas and she's off over here doing her own thing and is not interested in what he's doing and he's got his thing over here and he's doing that and uh, you know, he's not interested in what she's doing and she's not interested in what he's doing. They just sort of each go their separate ways. Well, no, that's not, that's not what's going to be. 
See, the church is going to be what he was designed to be, and that was a helper, compatible, fitting with. You know, it's pretty obvious what Jesus, what's important to Jesus Christ. And if we are going to be compatible with him, then obviously what's important to him is going to be important to us. Uh, you know, one of the things we, we talk about a lot of times with young couples is uh, uh, counsel them for marriage. Uh, you know, what are your goals? What are, what are your dreams? What are your aspirations? What, what do you want out of life? Because if one wants this and one wants that, and the two are incompatible visions, then there's going to be problems and there's going to be difficulties. We know what was important to Jesus Christ. You know, when he was 12 years old, his parents had come up to the feast, uh, to the Passover festival uh, there in Jerusalem. And after the festival, they were on their way back home. And uh, when they got to uh, their stopping point for the evening to camp, uh, they expected that Jesus was somewhere in the group, figured he was with some of his cousins and Looked around and nobody knew where he was. Well, then they turned around and went back to Jerusalem, looked all over the place trying to find him. And they found him. And when they found him, he wasn't out throwing rocks at the camels trying to, uh, you know, uh, stampede the Arabs' camels or something. No, they didn't find him out into mischief and trouble. They found him in the temple. And he was sitting there and he was listening to the doctors of the law and he was asking questions and answering questions and participating in the discussion of of the scriptures. Well, they were glad to see him, but they said, you have been so worried, we didn't know where you were. And he looked at them and he said, well, you didn't know where I was. You, you didn't figure that I needed to be about my father's business. You know, he knew who his real father was at that point. And he was anxious to be about his father's business. Well, he came home and he was subject to them, grew up, achieve maturity and later on in the gospel of john you read about the story as they were on their way from jerusalem uh, heading north up to nazareth and uh, they stopped they were coming through samaria and they stopped at a little town to get some food and jesus sat on the uh, uh, sat out there by the village well which was outside the, the little town on the edge of town uh, sat by the village well and they, the disciples went on into town to buy some food well, while he was sitting there, this woman came up and he got in a conversation with her. And the next thing you know, she went in, got some folks. And pretty soon when the disciples got back, there was a big crowd gathered around. Jesus was talking to them. And the disciples had this food and they were, you know, it was dinner time. They were ready to eat. I uh, said, uh, Lord, uh, here, you know, we got this food and, and, you know, and it's about time to eat. And Jesus said, I've got food to eat you don't know anything about. Well, they didn't get the point. They looked at one another and said, you reckon he's already had a sandwich? Maybe we ought to just go ahead and eat. And Jesus said, my meat, my food, is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. That was important to Jesus Christ. In fact, that was more important than anything else. So, you know, when people talk about the bride being prepared for the bridegroom, one of the most important aspects of that is that the bride is going to be compatible with the bridegroom. And if we're going to be compatible with Jesus Christ, number one, what's important to him is going to be important to us. You know, there are scriptures that talk about, Paul talks about in Philippians, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Having the mind of Christ. Because if we're going to be compatible with Christ, if we're going to fit with him and be able to help and assist him in ruling the nations, then we have to learn to think like he thinks, to be compatible in our thinking and in our desires and in what's important. You see, now is an opportunity when the church is identified as the bride of Christ. We are in a stage, you remember there were three aspects, there were three parts of the Jewish wedding ceremony, uh, or we would call it a wedding ceremony. It was stretched out sometimes over a period of uh, months and sometimes even over uh, a year or longer. The first part was the bride gift or the uh, bride price, as it's sometimes called. That didn't mean that you know she was purchased like a commodity. Uh, not at all, because when you read the story in the book of Genesis, for instance, uh, when Abraham sent his servant to obtain a wife for Isaac, 
Rebecca was asked. You know, they, they discussed the matter, and then her father and her brother said, well, let's call Rebecca in and ask her. It's up to her. You know, you want to go with this man? You, you ready to, uh, you want to go back and marry Isaac, or you want to stay? You don't, you don't have to go. And she, of course, chose to go. She could see that God's hand was in it. No, the purchase of the bride gift for the bride price was for the family of the bridegroom to establish, to show the great value that they attached to the bride. So when Abraham sent his servant to get a wife for Isaac, he had him get together a bunch of camels and he loaded them down with gifts. And he sent this camel caravan back there because he wanted the family to understand that he placed great value on this young lady. You know, today we have something that is a little bit comparable that really is uh, sort of comes from that, and that is uh, usually when a young man uh, asks a young lady to marry him, well, what does he do? He gives her a gift, gives her an engagement ring, uh, which is basically a token. Uh, that's what it goes back to. It was a gift. That it was a token of, of esteem, of, of, of value. You're, you know, I think you're really special. I want to give you something uh, to demonstrate to you uh, you know, how valuable you are to me, how much, uh, you know, something of, of, of that nature. Uh, you read the story later when Jacob had to flee uh, the family because he'd gotten in trouble and he went back to his mother's family and he met Rachel and he wanted to marry her. And Jacob had left town in a hurry, you know. <laughs> he, he was, uh, uh, he didn't stick around to pack his bags. He left with the clothes on his back and a walking stick in his hand. And when he got there, he didn't have uh, anything of value to offer except himself. And what did he do? He, he told Laban, he said, I'll work seven years. Well, you know, you can imagine how Rachel must have felt that here was a man that thought so highly of her that he was willing to offer seven years of his life to, to work. Because he didn't have anything, he didn't have, you know, something he could reach in his pocket and pull out. He didn't have a camel caravan that to establish the great value that he attached to, to her. He got to attach twice as much value to her because, uh, you remember the story, Laban pulled a switcheroo on him and said, oh, if you want her, you're going to have to work an extra seven years. Uh, well, Jacob did that too. And so uh, it uh, uh, that, that was the idea, to show that value. Well, you know, the Passover season certainly uh, is the means by which uh, the Father and Christ establish how the value that they place on the bride because uh, Jesus Christ gave himself as a sacrifice for us. Ultimately, the bride price, uh, the bride gift, was the life of Jesus Christ. Uh, the Father made the ultimate sacrifice. And uh, uh, in that sense, establishing uh, the uh, uh, that bride gift or bride price, then uh, the next phase after the bride gift was the espousal, which was the formal wedding contract or wedding covenant. Uh, when Israel entered into the covenant with God at Mount Sinai, uh, that was called in the book of Jeremiah the time of Israel's espousal in the wilderness. Now, once the espousal took place, the couple was considered married. If you remember the story in the New Testament, Joseph and Mary, she's called his espoused wife. That means that the contract had already been signed, the legal agreement, uh, the marriage was binding. That's why when Joseph initially found out that Mary was pregnant, and he thought, you know, his initial assumption uh, uh, was that uh, she was, uh, uh, was pregnant out of wedlock, and so his thought was about putting her away privately. Now, he had to have put her away because... Once the contract was signed, once the espousal, the wedding covenant was made, it took a formal divorce. It was, that was the case. But you see, today when we have a wedding ceremony, you go from the, uh, within a matter of minutes from the time that the uh, covenant is made, the, uh, on to the celebration and, and uh, the wedding night. But in that time, that was not the case. There was a time period, could be, relatively short, a few weeks, sometimes it was months, between the espousal and the wedding celebration, the uh, wedding banquet or supper and uh, after which the, bri the bridegroom took the bride to himself and established the new household. And that interim between the espousal and the celebration 
were the bride and the groom getting ready to set up their independent housekeeper, setting up their own their own household. We are now in the phase uh, between the spousal. We've entered into the covenant. We're we're apart. That's why the church can be called both the uh, uh, the Lamb's wife has made herself ready and the bride of Christ, because we are a spouse. We have entered into that covenant, uh, but we've not yet uh, had the celebration, the uh, uh, the banquet, the supper, as it were, and and uh, uh, have established that uh, that household. You know, we're in the preparation phase. We're preparing to rule with Christ. It's a time period right now of learning to be compatible with Him. We have His instructions. We have His directions. We have the information in Scripture to know what is the mind of Christ. And one of the things that is an issue for each of us and is an important part in terms of the bride of Christ, how important to us is what is important to Jesus Christ. We know what was important to him, the work of God. My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. To what extent is that important for us? Because if we're not excited about the work of God, if we're not excited about uh, doing what Christ did and being a part of that, then we're not developing that compatibility to be a helper compatible with him. And that's purpose of the bride of Christ, to be a helper compatible with Christ. Now, not only is the church compared to the bride of Christ, or called the bride of Christ, uh, the church is also called the body of Christ. And you find that back in Ephesians 4 and Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, that, uh, let's notice here in Romans 12, Romans 12, We'll pick it up in verse 4. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another, having gifts differing according to the grace that is given unto us. He goes through, discusses various of these gifts. Now, we're many, we have many members in one body. You know, you and I... Uh, have various members of our body. You have fingers and toes, hands and feet. You have eyes and mouth and nose and ears, all sorts of internal organs. And every member of the body is important. You know, you can take a pretty little member. Little toe is a pretty little member. Stub it good some night when you get up in the dark and you're trying to make your way from the bed to the bathroom and all of a sudden... The, the, you understand the scripture that says when one member of the body hurts, the whole body hurts. You know, the tooth, uh, you, your teeth, an individual tooth is a pretty small member of the body. Well, that's pretty insignificant, you know, just a little tooth. Well, let yourself get a toothache. And when one member of the body hurts, the whole body hurts. You know, one of the lessons that we are to learn about the church as the body of Christ, is that we're all involved together. You know, God didn't establish us simply to be uh, just individuals. Now, on a personal relationship, yes, we each have a personal relationship with, with God. Uh, it is us and God uh, in the sense that each of us has direct access to the Father. You don't go through another human being to get to the Father. You go through Jesus Christ. But we also have a, an important, an organic connection with one another, the members of the body. Members of the body represent an organism that functions together, and every member plays an important role, and the roles are different. But there's no role that you can eliminate and have the body function just as effectively. You know, you look years ago, there were science books, uh, basically uh, influenced by evolutionary thinking, that gave great long lists of what were called vestigial organs. You know, organs that you sort of had left over from being a monkey and didn't need anymore, but they hadn't somehow disappeared yet. Well, you know, the list has gotten shorter and shorter, and if they really understood everything they think they understood, uh, they would realize that there weren't any vestigial organs. 
everything has a purpose. If they don't know what the purpose is, all that means is they don't know what the purpose is. Which comes as a great shock to some of them that there are things that they actually don't know. Uh, most of them aren't, weren't as uh, honest as the doctor that was addressing the uh, entering freshman class in the medical school. And he told them, he said, uh, uh, you know, he said, we're going to teach you a lot of things here. And you're going to learn a lot over the next several years. But unfortunately, half the things we're going to teach you aren't true. The trouble is we don't know which half. Because you see, as the years go by, knowledge knowledge increases. A lot of what people think they knew, they find out wasn't quite that way. The body of Christ, we as individual members are just that. We all have an important part to play. You know, you look at the story and you say, well, Christ trained the twelve. And he sent them out. We, we know what their role was. I mean, Christ sent them out. And here was Peter. Well, Peter was the leader among the twelve. And you see various examples of that. And you see him taking a leading role in the book of Acts. And Peter was out preaching. And he was doing this. And he was doing that. You know, did, could the members just sort of sit back there and say, well, you know, we, we don't really have much important part in the body. I mean, Peter has an important part. He's out there uh, preaching and uh, God working miracles through him. We, we don't have anything important. Well, notice back in Acts 12. Acts chapter 12. We find Peter was arrested. Acts 12, verse 5. Peter, therefore, was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. And came right down to the wire. You know, the night before Herod was going to bring him in to execute him the next morning, God sent an angel and delivered Peter. Well, we know that Peter had an important role to play in the early church, but, you know, the rest of the members did too. Prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto Peter. You know, there are various examples. You could go back, uh, uh, for instance, uh, in, in the book of Philippians chapter 4, Paul is writing from prison. And one of the purposes that he wrote the book of Philippians was to thank the church in Philippi. Because, you see, they had sent a gift. They had sent an offering through to him. And uh, he makes the, the point in uh, verse 12, Philippians 4, verse 12, he says, I know both how to be abased and how to abound. Everywhere in all things I'm instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Notwithstanding, you have well done that you did communicate with my affliction. You helped out. Now, you Philippians know that in the beginning of the gospel, when things were just starting out, when I left Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent once and again unto my necessity. Not because I desire a gift, but that I desire fruit that may abound to your account. You know, it wasn't just Paul's ministry. It was Paul's ministry, and he was certainly used in a powerful way. But the rest of the members of the body had an important part, too. The Philippians had uh, been very helpful to him in, in supporting him. Uh, in Colossians chapter 4 and verse 3, in verse 2, he says, Continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving, with all praying also for us, that God would open unto us the door of utterance, to speak the mystery of Christ for which I'm also in bonds, that it may, I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. So he said, pray for him. Pray that God will open a door of utterance. Pray for an open door. You see, every member of the body had an important role. It wasn't just Peter. It wasn't just Paul. And as you go through and look at the stories, as you look at uh, Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12, uh, where it talks about the, the spiritual gifts, the various aspects of the body, uh, Paul goes through and he names all this, and he says, look, verse 14, the body is not one member, but many. This is 1 Corinthians 12, 14. If the foot says, well, I'm not a body, I'm not, I'm not a hand. If I can't be a hand, I don't guess I can be part of the body. Or what if the ear says, well, I'm not an eye. You know, the eye is what really counts. I'm not an eye. I, I'm not part of the body. 
Well, if the whole thing were an eye, where would be the hearing? And if it was all hearing, where would be the smelling? God has set the members, every one of them, in the body as it pleases Him. If there were one member, then there wouldn't be a body. There are many members, yet one body. And no member of the body can say to another member of the body, I don't need you. No, sometimes those members that seem to be more feeble are necessary. You can take some of the tiniest little organs in the body, you know, take the adrenal glands. They're not very big. You know, you take that out and throw it away. Well, if you did, you'd be in an awful lot of trouble. Uh, you know, sometimes things that are small, things that are hidden away, things that don't necessarily look so big and impressive. You see, the members, verse 25, are to have, have the same care one for another. When one member suffers, the, all the members suffer. One member is honored, all the members rejoice. We're the body of Christ and members in particular. We are individually members, collectively the body. We have a relationship with one another. Every member has value. That's one of the things to understand about the church. Every member has value. Every member has an important role to play. Now, there are various gifts, differences of gifts. Uh, he mentions what some of these gifts are uh, back in uh, uh, verse 8. To one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom. To another, the word of knowledge by the same Spirit. You know, some people uh, just have a certain skill, practical ability to apply things. And uh, they have a certain word of wisdom. wisdom the word wisdom uh, refers to, to being skillful, skillful in life, being able to sort of put things together and function and apply principles and just uh, some people are skillful at navigating life uh, with uh, maybe marriage or child rearing or, or business or whatever it may be, applying biblical principles. They're just skillful in how to do that. Others, the word of knowledge. Some have, you know, real ability to pick up facts and information and just an excellent source to uh, uh, others have a special gift for faith. Some have the gift of healing. To another, the work of working of miracles. To another, prophecy, inspired speaking. To another, discerning of spirit. To another, different kinds of tongues. To another, interpretation. These all work. The one and the self same spirit, dividing to everyone as he will. Uh, see, uh, Paul also brings out in, first, in uh, Romans 12 when he talks about the gifts of the spirit. Uh, Romans 12:6, gifts differing according to the grace that is given unto us, the gift that God gave us, whether prophecy, the ability to uh, speak under inspiration. If that's the gift, then let's do it according to the proportion of faith. Or ministry, that just means serving. Some have a gift for serving. And so you, you have a real knack for being able to serve. Some have a gift for teaching. Some have a gift, verse 8, for exhortation, for, for inspirational speaking, being able to motivate others. Some have a gift for giving. You know, just being able to give to others. God has maybe blessed them, and they're a little more affluent. They have certain things, have various things that they can give. Different people have, everybody has something that they can give. Some have a gift for giving. He that rules. Some people are good at administration. They're good at organizing things. You can turn something over to them, and they get it organized real well. I'll let them do it with diligence. Some have a, a gift, spiritual gift of showing mercy. Being able to encourage somebody that's down. You know, he just lists a variety. This isn't an exhaustive list. This is just that there are a variety of different ways and different things. And every bit of it is important. Every member of the body has value. We are part of a spiritual community. We are connected with one another. We're not just living our lives to ourselves as though it doesn't matter what happens to us or to you know, I'm me and, you know, he's him and we don't have to have any connection. No, we're, we're involved. We're connected with one another. And if we really understand that, then there's no room for jealousy. You know, when one member of the body is honored, the whole body is honored. You know, if you receive some honor, if you achieve some great reward and, uh, award and they pin a medal on your chest, would the uh, hand be insulted and say, well, that got on the chest. You know, I think I actually did the work. They stuck that on the chest. They should have stuck it on the hand. 
And the head said, well, if it hadn't been for me, you know, well, you, you should have stuck it on the head. And the gets mad and says, well, I know one that took you there. You know, if I just gone to sleep on the job, you couldn't have gotten there. I mean, that's sort of silly. And yet, the point of it is that that's the way we, if we really grasp the concept that we're the bride of Christ, then we're going to be preparing to rule with Christ. And that colors our whole approach to everything. If we really understand that we are the body of Christ, then we recognize our connection with one another. And we value each other. <laughs> what about the household of God? You know, that just means God's family. Household. Many of us, well, I guess all of us have a household. Maybe in you, maybe your household consists of one person. Maybe your household consists of, of uh, you know, father and mother and several children. Some have a large household. Some have a small household. But there's a family relationship. See, that's another that's another description of the church. In Galatians 6.10 says, uh, well, let's pick it up in verse 9. It says, let us not be weary in well-doing. In due season we shall reap if we faint not. Don't get tired and quit. As we have, therefore, opportunity, let us do good unto all men especially to them who are of the household of faith. Now, he didn't say that the only ones you ought to help are the family. What he said was, as you have opportunity, do good to everybody, anybody. Anybody you meet is your neighbor. So, do good to anybody, but especially to them of the household of faith. The family, the household of faith, that represents the starting point, but not the stopping point. You know, we have a special obligation to our family, but uh, uh, beyond that, we also have an obligation or responsibility to, uh, uh, to anyone that, that we're in a position to help out. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2 and uh, verse 18 says, Through him, through Christ, we both have access by one Spirit unto the Father. Now, therefore, you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. You're part of the family. Well, Paul is writing this, and specifically in the context here in Ephesians, he's uh, addressing Gentiles. And he says, you're not outsiders anymore. You're part of the family. You're members of the household of God. See, God's building a family. And a family is going to live together in peace and harmony forever. You know, a family is designed, to, or God's purpose for the family is to provide a healthy environment for growth and development. Family is there to uh, uh, provide a certain stability. That's the fundamental building block of society. Uh, that provides the uh, nurturing, healthy environment where little kids can, can uh, grow up to adulthood. The family plays big roles and providing an environment for growth. So the church is to be the household of God. God is the Father, and we're all part of the family. And therefore, the church was intended, as part of its purpose, to provide uh, that uh, healthy, nurturing environment that's conducive for, for spiritual growth and development. You know, there are extremes sometimes in families that are both unhealthy. Sometimes you see families that are just sort of disconnected from one another. It's like strangers, sort of each sort of in his own little, little, little world. Not really that much connected with one another. Just sort of disconnected. Sort of disinterested. On the other hand, you can see other extremes. You see families that are just sort of enmeshed in one another's lives and, and it's stifling. Uh, no individual has room to grow and develop and be himself because everybody's all entangled in, in everybody else's business. And you have strife and turmoil. You know, the, things can be chaotic. Things can be rigid and, and controlling. And, and you can, there are a lot of ways for things to be wrong, for things to be unhealthy. And growth is not healthy. 
God designed, you see, that there's a family. There's a certain accountability that we have when you read uh, in the church, uh, or you read uh, Paul's letters to the churches. You read that he emphasized that everybody wasn't just living their own life, and it was their own business what they did and nobody else. You know, when he addressed the issue uh, in Corinth, for instance, of the man who was living in an incestuous relationship. Well, Paul didn't say, well, you know, that's fine. I mean, hey, everybody eats to his own. No, you see, hey, this, this, we're all part of the same family. You can't, you can't live like that and be part of the family. Because you're not going to be part of the family forever if you continue to live like that. There was a concern. There was, there was a relationship. See, the church is preparing to marry Christ, to be a compatible helper to Jesus Christ in the millennium and on into eternity. The church is also the body of Christ. It is the means by which Christ is working, and every individual member is important and has value and serves an important role in the, in the body. And not only that, we're also the household of God, the family. There's a family relationship, a relationship that we have with one another as brothers and sisters caring about one another, encouraging one another, trying to bolster one another, trying to learn to practice the principles of godliness and peace, to bring out the best in one another, not to tear one another down, but to build one another up. You see, if we really understand the mysteries of the kingdom that Christ explained in the parables, then we understand where the work is headed and what it's all about. If we understand the descriptions that are given in the Bible and the comparisons that are given, then it helps us to understand our whole purpose right now and what God is developing. We have to deeply value and appreciate one another because God does. God attaches that. And we're all members one of another. And Every member, individually, has a valuable function. And the whole body is the collection of its members. It's by one spirit that we're all baptized into one body. Ultimately, it is the spirit of God that connects us with one another and ultimately connects us with the Father. So, as we look at these things... We realize that while a lot of people talk about religion in the Bible, they really don't have a biblical view of understanding the whole purpose that's being worked out. You and I need to understand from the examples and illustrations God gives us the purpose for which Jesus Christ began to build his.